change. And what I just heard on that panel just sounded very resonant with so many of the things that I'm, the, re the research that I'm doing, the insights that I'm coming across, the people I'm researching. So just very, just very exciting. And I mean that in a very genuine way. But um, anyway, so, so uh, my talk uh, today um, um, is called The Natural History of Us. I'm going to explore what the role of spas and wellness might be in this transformation that we're going through. But I'd like to begin uh, just by acknowledging that I am presenting to you today from the traditional land of the Wampanoag people, both past and present. And I'd also like to honor with gratitude the land and the sea of this region and all people who have stewarded these habitats throughout the generations. So I wanna be really clear right up front that in this talk, I am not going to be proposing any kind of best practices or you know, things that we can do to enhance sustainability in any particular way. Um, I heard a lot of that. What I'm really going to be to focusing in on is, well, what is the ethos that compels us to implement those practices? I wanna go deeper. I really wanna go down into the deep um, uh, causes and motivations that humans have for taking care of themselves and for and the planet. So I just, I wanted to make sure and be clear on that before I start. Um, so I found this quote. This is a quote that I came across when I was doing my PhD research. It's from an, a very obscure book by a, a, a geologist that you've never heard of. It's all very, but when I came across this, it just seemed to encapsulate precisely the kind of research that I want to be doing. I can't see the top line, but it says, um, let's see if I can get this to work. Well, you can read it. Uh, and, and the second sentence there is that man's most profound interferences with nature have their origin in his thoughts. I was going to put the little sick in the brackets, but I, but I, I sort of figured that actually the, the gender assignment here is actually probably appropriate. But um, this is the idea here, is that what this work is about and what Oika is about, which I'll explain to you in a minute, is we're talking about qualities and processes and patterns that appear in the way that human beings think and perceive the world, and especially how they identify with that world or not. So here's my proposal, that health and wellness spas are uniquely positioned to play a profound restorative role in the ongoing transformation by shifting the deep structures of human consciousness. I have to say, again, everyone that I've heard speak on this panel so far already knows this. Um, but what I'm going to do is to, in some ways, validate and affirm what what these people you already know um but i'm going to use science to do it um but before i do that i just thought i'd pr present you a little bit about me um so you know who's driving the ship here for the next uh, 50 minutes um i'm rich blondell i grew up in new england in a little coastal town it's very much a um neglected child in, in the best possible way. I was left alone to explore the neighborhood and get into trouble and get scraped up and bruised and just, you know, climb trees, bicycle accidents, you know. And I my theory is that um, as a child, when in that really formative stage of life, if you are exposed to the natural world, um, especially through like scrapes and things like that, it actually gets into you. The place that you're from can get into you in a very profound way. And I've found that to be incredibly true. Um, and it's guided my life ever since. But that's my sort of earliest um, upbringing was just in the swamps and the forests and the, um, the even the vacant lots and the old cranberry bogs, that sort of thing. Uh, and then I, uh, in, in fact, I did so much of that out in the world that I didn't really go to school much. Uh, so I was really not a good student through through high school, I didn't get along with formal education originally, uh, and so I became a 
instead of going to college, I, I, I decided to become a commercial fisherman. I had discovered the, the, the ocean nearby and I was a lobsterman for many years. And then I um, one day I d- just decided to g- get into the bluefin fishery, which is out of this place called Stellwagen Bank off the tip of Cape Cod. And um, it turns out that all of my experiences as a child, you know, playing in the woods and just being really down in the mud, um, along with that came a kind of intelligence. And I used that intelligence to catch fish. And I, I, was, I was really good at it. Uh, and not, not too long after I started fishing for bluefin, I caught one. I caught my first bluefin tuna, which was actually my last bluefin tuna. This story is told, there's a video on my website you can look at, but it was just this 800 pound tuna that really just stopped me in my tracks when I killed it. I watched it die. It had this profound effect on me. Um, And at that point, I decided to stop fishing. I decided to get serious about school, went back to school and, you know, my academic career started from there. And the reason, the reason that I wanted to go back to school was to really learn how something like that could happen. So I'm not saying that the fish spoke English to me or anything like that, but it did communicate something to me in that moment. And uh, it just instilled in me this deep desire and curiosity to understand how that could happen. And that's how my academic career got back on track. Um, So through that training, I became a geologist. I wanted to study the earth. I wanted to be outside. Those are my two primary motivations for anything that I do, Uh, to be outside and to be in nature. And I wanted to learn about the earth systems. Uh, And then beyond that, I became an ecologist. I ended up uh, teaching a lot of wildlife research, um, a lot of invertebrate, marine zoology, oceanography, kind of thing. Uh, And then after a bachelor's degree in the sciences, I I focused my attention on the history and philosophy of science because I wanted to know how the science worked, but more importantly, how it doesn't work. There's some really important discoveries um, and sort of reconciliations that are going on right now in the sciences where, you know, the methods by which we do science don't hold up at certain scales. And it's causing us to really rethink the basic fundamentals of science. And I wanted to understand that. So I got a master's degree in that. After that, I decided um, I wanted to study the whole cosmos. And so I found this program that was happened to be in Australia. It's called Big History. And they were offering the first ever big history PhDs. So I went down there to to study that. It's the history of the cosmos uh, that includes the human story. And I'm in a in a minute, I'm gonna we're gonna take a deep but brief dive into that story. So you'll get a sense for what that means. But the other thing was just that there are there are really surprising and um, profound insights that that emerge when you study deep time, long time scales. And then I had something that uh, I can only describe as an art epiphany. As a scientist, I was never exposed to art. I was never asked to do art, and I never did. Uh, And then one day, through this real fluke, I was actually looking for this specific kind of um, uh, 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 a fossil. It's called the Uids. It's this calcium carbonate deposit over in Italy. And while I was there, I couldn't get to the quarry. So instead, I went to go look at some sculptures that were made out of limestone that I really wanted to see. And in and in again, just like the tuna, it snuck up on me, and there was something in this in this sculpture. It was in Florence, Italy, in Uffizi, and uh, it floored me. I couldn't couldn't walk, couldn't stand up, could barely breathe, had heart palpitations. Turns out it's this thing called Stendhal syndrome. Some people have it when they're exposed to art or great beauty. They just their system gets overwhelmed, and it happened to me. But but the epiphany that I had during that in in that event. Um, was that art is an incredibly powerful uh, communication um, um, means that humans have evolved. And I'm going to, when I tell the story of the cosmos in a minute, you're going to see where that, where that comes from, where that capacity to do art comes from. And it comes from a very surprising place. Uh, And then uh, throughout all of this, I was really interested in my own transformative experience, the tuna, the art epiphany, these were transformative experiences for me. So I really wanted to understand the nature of those transformations, how they happen, what elicits them. And this is the realm of the cognitive sciences. So I got really involved with understanding how human beings make sense of the world. How do we think? How do we perceive the world? And how do I identify with the world? 
Uh, and it's been an incredibly rich um, field, uh, very informative to the kind of research and work that I want to do. But also, um, just like the sciences in general, the cognitive sciences are going through huge transformations right now. We're having just incredible breakthroughs in our understanding about how humans think. And, you know, they used to call consciousness a hard problem because no one could solve it. I don't think that's true anymore. It doesn't quite make sense to me that consciousness is hard, um, especially when you look at it through the deep time lens that I'm about to tell you about. So lately, I've been doing what I call OICA research. Um, and I'm going to tell you about what OICA is in a minute. Um, but it's a word, the word OICA, just to say it now, it comes from the ancient Greek oikos, uh, which back then meant um, home or house. Uh, and oika is actually the, 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 um, the word from which the prefix eco is derived. So the word ecology comes from the Greek word oikos. But so does the word economy. So the eco that's in economy is also linked to the eco that's in ecology. And I think this is a forgotten, uh, this is a forgotten relationship that 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 um, that prosperity and um, flourishing of ecosystems and economies can be recoupled. Because right now they're not coupled. You know, take economic gain comes at the at the price of ecological health and those two things need to be brought back into a conforming relationship. So anyway, that's what OICA means. OICA research, the kind of research that I've been doing is I'm really studying mostly the symmetries and the asymmetries that show up between nature and culture, uh, which is, I know that's a little bit broad. And we're, I'm also involved with a lot of um, ecological restoration projects and just understanding how nature and culture be can become more aligned. Um, from personal to cultural levels. So this journey brought me all over the world, I just need to say, uh, over the decades of doing this, I spent lived a, for quite a long time in East Africa, sailed the oceans, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro 11 times, you know, used to run safaris all over Central America. So I've had this very deep and expansive relationship with this planet. Um, and this actually comes into play later. Uh, the fact that I've had this journey and had this intimate contact with many of this of the Earth's habitats is actually where the insight for Oika comes from, and so um, it's relevant. Anyway, and this last um, bullet point here, which is disruptor, um, disruption is a common concept in ecological studies, and what many people don't understand is that disruption is actually can be actually. A, uh, a very productive and, and good force in nature. When a, you know when a tree falls in a rainforest, sure, it's not good for the particular tree, but it creates all kinds. Of this disturbance and this disruption causes all kinds of um, energies and, uh, and and new relationships to kick into play. And it's actually healthy for a system to go through disruption. And in my case, I know this is getting long here, but but in my case, what that means, and this is just something that I've only recently come to understand. What my role has been is like, I have pretty much left academia. Uh, I still love science, but I'm also a critic of science. And I've in some sense left, you know, I don't, I'm not doing bench science or anything like that anymore. But um, what I have done is to look back at the scientific community and to say, you know, knowledge production, which is what we usually think of as science, the production of knowledge, scientific knowledge, I think we I think we need to expect more from science than just the production of knowledge. And and one of the ways I'm trying to disrupt the scientific community is to say the role is bigger than that. You need to show us who we are. You need to show us who we are by showing us where we come from. You need to show us the context in which we are things are happening, the context of our planet in a solar system and the context of humanity on a planet. Science can do that. It doesn't currently, but my point as a disruptor is that I'm saying it can do that and you need to do more. So not only am I doing that with the sciences, but recently I've been working with a lot of artists. And what I'm finding is that I'm doing the same thing with the artistic community. What I'm saying to them is that art is about more than just you know designing new sneakers or creating pretty pictures or even celebrating your artistic ego. 
Art can be about much more than that. Just like the sciences can be about much more than that. Art can actually show us and can, can communicate profound insights about who we are and how, how to get out of this mess. And so that's another way that I brought this disruptor role. And it's the same thing that's happening in all of the organizations that I'm interfacing with right now. I'm telling them that, you know, whatever you seek to do, you can do more. You can help us heal. You can help us grow. You can help us uh, um, move forward. And it's even now happening. I'm, I'm working with the indigenous communities where I'm from. And I, I see that I'm saying pretty much the same thing. I'm saying that, they, that their insights are more valuable than they even know. They're more relevant and needed in our, in our society more than ever. So that's what I mean by disruptor. And here's the, here's the take-home message from that. I see it also in the wellness and spa community. It's, it's the same idea of disruption. I really believe that the, and actually I think it's here, the proposal is that health and wellness spas are positioned to play a profound restorative role in the ongoing transformation by shifting the deep structures of human consciousness. So I'm just saying that again, like this is a, this is a much, I know, we, I know this community already knows this, but what I'm saying is let's take it really seriously. Let's use the best science, tell, tell really compelling stories. Let's make this a lived experience. Let's make, you know, the ecological situation that we're in palpable so that we can care about the world. And this is, this is a really another, another really interesting insight that's just come from my brief interaction and research of your industry is that you're about self-care. Care is the key word there, but and, and but here's the here's the opportunity. Well, is that that self care can be extended to include the planet, and I'll show how that happens in a minute. But here's an outline for the rest of my talk. First, I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the context of our of our predicament and why Oika and this work is so important. Um, I'm going to introduce Oika more more formally. I'm going to then give you a very brief natural history of us tour to show you what the content of Oika is. Then we're going to I'm going to explore a little bit more about what the role of spas and wellness could be with, and I'm going to ask your help in that. And we, we can go to the Q and A. So the context, the great context of our time is this thing. I, I think it's, I think it's non-trivial that, that I'm a geologist and that, that quote that I shared with you about that our, our, our deepest problems that we cause are, are grounded in our thoughts. He was actually a geologist and it's geologists that came up with the term Anthropocene refers to this period of time. It's like a geologic epic and where the Anthropos humans have caused just, you can just see the, the graph here. It's, we're not in right alignment. We're, we're not in right relationship with the planet and we're putting these systems out of control. And this is the graphic that they've come up with. It's called the planetary boundaries framework. You can look at that. But a lot of scientists who are very analytical prefer things like this because this shows this shows this pattern. These are the Earth system trends, and you pick one, and they're all on this exponential curve. Okay, but what I find interesting is that if you take these graphs, which are socioeconomic trends, and compare them to these Earth system trends, you can see how it's the same pattern. So the Earth systems and the socioeconomic systems are are deeply intertwined, and the the, the picture's not good. So, but we're not all analysts and we're not all just interested in this kind of quanti quantitative data. So the question is, what's the reality of the Anthropocene? Well, it's something like this and this and this. Now I'm just gonna hold for one second here and look at these three images. And if you were to say, look at the first one, you might say, if I were to say, well, what's the problem here? You might say, well, it's desertification or the one on the top right, you might say, oh, it's, it's the problem is pollution. And on the bottom, you might say, well, that's the problem there is deforestation. But getting back to what my original, original sort of proposal was that these aren't the problems. Desertification is not the problem. Desertification is the symptom of overgrazing. Pollution is the symptom of hyperconsumption. Deforestation is a symptom of, you know, perverse, perverse um, incentives that cause us to clear cut forests. So these are actually psychological problems. And until we actually address them at the psychological level, they're going to continue. And that's exactly what we see. So this is, looks like a problem of you know, pollution. This looks like a problem of urban sprawl. And this, how could this be, uh, how could this be a, 
a problem that's associated with nature. It looks political or, or civil unrest. But again, my proposal here is that all of these problems are rooted, all of these symptoms are rooted in a deeper problem, a deeper cognitive problem that's within humans. And to cut to the chase, I think that that problem is a disconnect, a disconnect from our home, the oikos of our belonging. And until we rectify that, until we heal that disconnect, that divorce from nature, these problems are going to continue and they're going to get worse. Um, but this isn't the, you know, so I just put the, I just put AI up on the screen. This technology is going to be so disruptive in the next two decades. This is going to create immense anxieties. It's going to create massive disruption in our economic systems and the way human beings lead their lives. And so the question here for wellness and spas, how are you going to respond? How are you going to respond to the, to the disruptions that something like AI, not to mention the ecological and political and the economic disruptions that we're going through anyway, when you add this on top of it, I mean, it's an incredible challenge, but it's also an incredible opportunity if we're, if we're ready to be the disruptors. So moving right along, again, the proposal, just to keep this focused, is that health and wellness spas position to play a profound role in the ongoing transformation by shifting deep human consciousness. Back to the outline, I'm going to now talk a little bit more about what OICA is. So OICA is, basically, it is the intelligence of nature. Um, that's as simple as I can say it, that there's a, that there's a intelligence behind the way that nature creates. And for lack of a better term, I call it Oika. This intelligence, and this is really important, is an intelligence of relationships. Remember, I'm an ecologist. That means I study relationships. And what I see when I see nature is a matrix of relationships. Oika refers to intelligence of nature that, that arises from relationships. And the quality of the relationships shape the quality of the intelligence. Now, this intelligence, or oika, is actually the driver of cosmic creativity. And you can see this once you start looking at what's been going on in the cosmos. Once you see how this creativity manifests, you see it anywhere that you look in the cosmos, not just in things that are happening on Earth, but things that are happening out in deep time, in galaxies far away, in planetary systems, all the way back to the Big Bang, you can see this creativity at work. It's scale independent. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just I, I want to acknowledge how this intelligence has a fractal component to it, that it's not just located in any particular entity. It actually shows up as a pattern across entities. So it's scale independent. You can see it at the microscopic scale. You can see it at the macroscopic scale. You can see it at the quantum. You can see it at the cultural. It's also, by the way, substrate independent, but we'll get into that. So Oika, this intelligence, I think, is the creative life force of the universe. And this is really cool. When you start to study life, biology, you realize that all living things participate in this intelligence in order to thrive. That's what it is. That's what it means to thrive, is to hold this ecological oika intelligence in order to make your decisions and coordinate with others. This is a, a deeply ecological principle, but it's at the, and, and it's actually, it predates life. You can see these same organizing principles happening at the scale of, of a solar system before there was even an Earth. You can see these dynamics playing out much simpler than they do in, in our um, situation. But my point is you can see them across scales and through time. And it's also the basis for all abundance because it is a creative life force. And I don't want to sound naive here to say that it's all, you know, beautiful and feels you know, wonderful. And it's, there's also destruction, but that destruction is part of that creative force. It's not the other way around. If it were the other way around, we wouldn't be here, but we are, which means, which means on the whole, this creative force has been active and we are 
we are the recipients of it today. We live in, we live among it. Now, here's the other really interesting, another really interesting insight is that this intelligence of Oika is in all of us. We've all inherited it from our ancestry, from the long lineage that came before us, have been carrying this intelligence forward. Um, I know this starts to sound quite ethereal or unscientific, but I'm not using anything other than science to come to these conclusions. I'm not doing science, but I am using what science has revealed to come to these conclusions. And here's, here's another one that's really important, I think, to, to my proposal in this talk, is that this intelligence can be felt and it can be expressed by humans. I think I felt it when the tuna was, you know, communicated to me. And I think that many of the people that I heard on that, everybody that I heard on that call this morning are expressing it in one way or another. You can hear it and you can see it, you can feel it and you can communicate it, you can express it. And finally, it feels really good. When you are aligned with this creative force that I'm calling Oika, you can feel it. So, um, which I can't see that. Uh, the, um, but you can read it. It's, it's basically saying this is the, called Leopold's land epic. A thing is right when it, when it it's, it's preserves the integrity and stability and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. This is just a principle that I want to state because I think it's important to how Oika works and what makes and, and, and validates Oika in some ways. But what I would add to that is that when your thoughts and actions advance the creative cause of life, you are manifesting oika and it feels good, okay? So in other words, it's it's trending towards stability and integrity and beauty as opposed to anything else. It feels good. And here's, here's where I think that self-care thing comes in, that if it feels good for you and it has ecological intelligence or oika, if it feels good for you, it is for the planet, if it has that. Does that see what I'm saying? This isn't about hedonic pleasure. It could be. It could be deeply pleasurable. But the point is that an, 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 um, an ecologically intelligence kind of pleasure not only feels good, but it's good for the planet as a whole. It makes the it makes the planet heal. It helps the planet heal. And this is where this idea of self care that you that your that your community is really um, familiar with and has really thought a lot about is how can we take the self care of the self and make it applicable to the planet and to others at the same time. That's, that's the beauty of this. So Oika is also, just, I'll just recap, it's scientific, it's based on deep scientific knowledge. It is also narrative, okay, which means it's storied. This, this is another thing that goes deep into our evolutionary history. Why does story work so well with humans? Well, it, it, because we've because it's successful for us because being able to tell stories has been incredibly successful in an evolutionary sense but what's really fascinating is when you learn where did that capacity to tell stories come from and i'm going to tell you that in a minute it's also ex experiential so it can be felt you can actually feel the intelligence of nature when you when you understand how to identify it when you understand where it comes from and how it's in you how it's in every human being, you can actually begin to experience it. It's palpable. Now, the question is, is it spiritual? I'm often accused as a scientist speaking in a spiritual way. And the fact is, I've had to kind of abandon the idea that I cannot use spiritual language to speak about my, the scientific knowledge that I, that I have. And so I've kind of given up on that idea, but, but, it, but that's not actually the point. It just happened to be, to be a byproduct of a deep scientific investigation. Who is it that said, I think it's usually attributed to Louis Pasteur. And he said, you know, a, a little bit of science will bring you away from God, but a lot of science will bring you back. There's something like that that happens. If you, if you really get beyond the reductionist and the objective sort of injuries of science, you discover that there's deep meaning and, and, and significance to be discovered as well. Now, is that a spiritual experience? I don't know. <laughs> that's, for, that's for you to decide. Um, so the proposal again, is just that health and wellness spas can play a role 
in shifting the consciousness toward this. Now I'm going to move on to the, the content of Oika, which is the natural history of us. Okay. Um, this is a course that I teach. I can teach it in the course of a college semester or, or a course of a month. Uh, but I'm going to give you a very brief and very sort of quick history of the whole universe in a moment. So buckle up. Okay. So we begin this 13.8 billion years ago in a dark void. And the funny thing is, is actually we know what's back there. But what it is, is mystery. So we don't really know. But by acknowledging that there's a mystery deep down before the Big Bang, it kind of frees us up to now consider, well, what do we do know? What, what, what do we actually know? And this is not to dismiss that mystery, but it's actually to carry it forward. So that mystery is present before the Big Bang. We can actually think of it as present right here, right now. So the universe begins in mystery and it carries that mystery up to today. I'm not saying anything that's outside the bounds of science. But then for some reason we don't know, there's this flaring forth of energy. Uh, it's an event called the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. As best we understand it, these quantum fluctuations that somehow get sorted out. There's this period of rapid expansion. It's, 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 it's hot. It's unimaginably dense. It's small, compressed, but relatively simple. Okay? There might be a lot of energy and a lot of density, but there's not a lot of complexity at the Big Bang. But ultimately, these forces, these quantum forces, sort themselves out in a way until we get the fundamental forces of physics that we're familiar with, things like gravity and the weak nuclear force, strong nuclear force, electromagnetism, the Yankee suck. These are the fundamental forces of the universe that, that came about. And by about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, we see this. What this is, is a, it's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, this is a picture that we've taken with a satellite that sees the world in um, um, microwave, the micro band of light. Um, so if you could tune your eyes to the microwave band and looked out up into the sky, you'd see this pattern behind the clouds. You'd see it all, that's why it's called the background radiation. But remember, I'm a, in many, I'm an ecologist. And so when I see this image, what I see is an ecosystem. This is actually an ecosystem of light. It's the primordial ecosystem of light. Those color differences you see with the oranges and the blues, those are differences in the energy levels of that particular point in space or the temperature. Okay, so there's tiny differentials in temperature imprinted from quantum fluctuations on this image. So this is like a snapshot of the very early universe. But what it shows is that the universe itself is an ecosystem. This is why ecological dynamics are still like at play in the world we inhabit today. And here's another really cool thing. You see those blue areas? That's where the first stars formed. So 100 million years after the Big Bang, those blue areas have a little less energy. And so it allows matter, hydrogen and helium to congregate. You get enough hydrogen and helium congregating and you ignite a nuclear force that we call a star. So the very first starry night would have corresponded to the pattern that you see here. And then that starry night would evolve into other starry nights, into later starry nights until you get to our starry night. So there's this direct lineage of the starry night that you'll see tonight that goes all the way back to this pattern. So after that cooled, we get this thing called the mega scale structure of the universe. And it has this, it has this kind of a structure. This is what it looks like. And you might say like, boy, that looks an awful lot like like, like um, a mycelial network or, or a neurological system. Well, it does. This is one of those fractals that shows up. It's just a, it's a pattern that can repeat across scales. So you'll see this at the scale of the, you know, a forest you know, as a mycelial network and even the whole cosmos itself. Every fractal that you see in this story is not just mathematical equation that shows up again and again. It's actually a reminder that the processes that create the universe and that show up in mycelial networks are also within us. This is a powerful signifier that we 
are connected, that we belong to this system, that we're in communication with it. These are the insights of Oika that I'm going with. So eventually, um, some of those stars that form will self-organize into structures like this. This is spiral galaxies, probably uh, Andromeda, one that we can see through binoculars from Earth. And this is like this, the galaxy that we're in. So the Milky Way is quite similar to this one. And we just happen to find ourselves out in a one of the, you know, sort of a, an obscure spiral arm, the Milky Way. Now, stars go through life cycles. This is actually isn't, uh, this is a, a, a depiction of um, the, the, the our sun after it formed, it would have been in the, the basically the rubble of a supernova. And you would have seen lots of dust and rocky pieces and ice and things like that. And it forms this accretionary disk around the star, in this case, our sun. And it's from within that accretionary disk that planets form. So we see this differentiation happening um, across this, um, across a solar system, differentiation happening across galactic systems. And we're going to see differentiation happening across all systems, like the Earth itself goes through this important differentiation process, and so do species. There's a period of Earth that we really won't spend time much here because this is called the, the late heavy bombardment era or the Hadean. This is a picture of the early Earth. And one of the things you'll notice is that there's no life, very inhospitable to life. Imagine this image, you know, if you look, if you can look out your window, there was a time when it looked like this out your window, but look at it now. This earth is just bristling with life forms. There's so much going on. How does that happen? How, how could we go from a planet that had nothing on it to the planet we see today? Well, it's that ecological intelligence. It's that oika, that creative life force of the universe in action. There was a period when the planet almost froze solid from pole to pole, um, the cryogenian. But we're not going to really too talk much about that. But what was going on somewhere beneath the ice, probably perhaps down at high uh, at sub uh, thermal vents in the deep ocean, there was this new process, this new emergent process that we now call life, and that was happening down. And then we have this explosion of it. This is called the Cambrian explosion. This is when life really took off and 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 diversified and tried all new different experimental um, ways of making a living, um, and then. Of course, that leads eventually to the, you know, a, a world uh, that has that has um, um, dinosaurs all over it. So 65, 66 million years ago, but there was this, this horrendous um, a remnant from the time when the solar system was forming. This, this meteorite comes back, comes home to Earth, lands, wipes out the dinosaurs. They go extinct, but... As I was saying before, every challenge like that creates an opportunity. So in the shadows of the dinosaurs, there were these little mammalian creatures that were sort of just scurrying around, these little warm-blooded creatures that had fur. And when the dinosaurs went extinct and they couldn't withstand the, the, the long winters that followed that impact, it gave these mammals a chance. And they evolved through time and through relationship over, over geologic time into a creature that started to look something like this. This is an artist's depiction, obviously, but this shows an early primate. Um, I think this is probably um, a species called Sahelanthropus, Sahelanthropus chidensis. And so this would be about six or seven million years ago. You can see they're starting to walk upright. Um, they, they're bipedal, they have opposable thumbs, they're living in a social group. And then something really special happens. And, and this is all conjecture but it all corresponds to the science and the fossil record that we have that one spe one individual perhaps in a certain family group sitting up in a tree looks down and sees something to eat berries okay this is the world this is this is nature communicating to the primate to come down out of the trees and to go and get the berries and and if we can imagine that this was maybe a matriarch of the group a lot of her sisters and their children and some of the bachelor males that were just sort of mulling around would go with her, okay? So what we see is that there's this little nucleus of a family that leaves the trees, okay? They're probably part of a bigger community of primates, but they leave the trees and they set out across the African 
woodlands, okay? And in the process of doing that, with each successive day, they're getting further and further away from the larger group, okay? So this Sahelanthropus ends up evolved into this species, which is um, uh, Australopithecine forensis. So this is Lucy, it's about 3.7 million years ago. And we actually have fossilized footprints that, that we can recreate a scene like this from. So we can see the guinea fowl prints and we can see the, the, the elephant prints. And we know that there was a lot of volcanic activity. So this scene is actually could be, you know, it's, 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 it's a depiction, of course, but it, it's kind of accurate. We, we can actually recreate the steps because you can see this is, this is one of these fossilized um, footprint beds. And you can actually recreate the movements of these hominids across the landscape. And so we continue this journey now, this, this primate species that was coaxed out of the tree by those berries has now crossed several different habitats on the African continent. I like to imagine that this is Australopithecine, maybe that's Lucy, the famous one there in the front, and her mate is carrying those, those seeds. And she looks down and she sees this volcanic rock on the ground and she says to herself, you know, if I just made this edge a little sharper, I might be able to remove the husk from that seed and then my family could eat. What is she doing there? Like what, what's happening there? What's happening is that this primate has developed a way of telling a story. This is the emergence of narrative in the universe, as far as we know, that this primate looks down and, and the rock itself teaches her to say, if I do this, this will happen. If I, this happens, this will happen. That's a series of, of, of causal consequences that we that 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 represents the capacity to tell a story if this happens then this happens then this happens then that happens that's a story and so what we see here is that the earth itself has taught this primate who who took it who had the initiative to go out across the world and learn from it it's taught us how to tell story the same capacity that we use today to tell stories emerged somewhere on the african plains now did you see that can you feel the difference between this and this? Like there's a there's a, a palpable difference in the way that this feels. My proposal here is that this is actually the emergence of aesthetic capacities. This could be even like a precursor to like an, an artistic appreciation because whoever made this didn't have to make it so symmetrical. In fact, it would be more effective as a as a cutting tool if it wasn't symmetrical because you wouldn't have to hold a sharp edge. The point is what we see here is a hominid who is actually sacrificing the utility of something in order to enhance the aesthetic value of something. This is all going somewhere. I, I, I'm sure you showed up today not knowing that you were going to be listening to somebody wax on about the cosmic microwave background radiation and, and australopithecine stone tools. But the point is, is that I'm, this, is, this is the natural history of us. So those were probably created by Homo habilis, depicted here. But again, it represents this in, this expanding, um, um, this, is, uh, this is not an accurate depiction of the, of the root or anything, we don't know, but we do know that these early primates moved out in a diaspora from one place and ended up encountering many different habitats. And as they went through, this, through the eons and eons of generations, these habitats each taught the primate different things. So this, so what I'm saying here is the earth itself was what taught us how to tell stories, how to do art. And here's another one. This doesn't look as interesting, but this is a really complex method for creating a stone tool. What the, what the primate wanted was, the, was that last piece that you see there on the right. But in order to do that, it had to create a surface. So it had to, it had to chip away at it in order to create a surface that with a final blow, that one, would create the tool that they want. So whoever did this had to know or had to be able to see one thing, the stone tool, in terms of another thing, the base. To see one thing in terms of another. What's that? Well, we call that today metaphor. So the capacity to do metaphor was also acquired through the production of these stone tools. The world is teaching us its intelligence over eons and eons and generations. This is why we've inherited it. We all hold this intelligence. And with that, the ability to tell stories, the appreciation for, for beauty, and the capacity for metaphor, 
We set out across the entire planet, telling stories, surviving, thriving, multiplying. And, and that's how the human beings came to such a dominant position. I, I don't mean that in a hierarchical way, but we, we have, we've, been, we've lived all over this planet. This is, the, this is what I call earthling theory that deep within, with a thing that actually makes us human, you know, we think of all of our capacities uh, to do art, to tell stories, to have imagination, to dream about things, to take care of each other, to have compassion and empathy. These things that we think make us human, well, it turns out it was the earth that endowed us with those capacities. And we have forgotten this reality. We, for what, through whatever accident of history, we have somehow forfeited this deep endowment of the earth that, 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 that fills me with gratitude, makes me feel deeply connected, makes my well-being feel tied to the well-being of the planet itself. And so you can see now when I'm talking about the self-care that we talk about at spas can somehow be transposed onto the self-care that we feel collectively as a species, as civilizations. Anyway, so if you take this, this, the capacity for storytelling, and you combine it with this, the capacity for the appreciation of art, and this, the ability to do metaphor, and you set out across the world and you encounter something like this, what do you do? You create this. The first art that we see is, is um, typically a, 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 uh, an attempt to express one's belongingness to the world. If that's not a forgotten role for art, I don't know what is. So when you continue on your journey and you come across something like this, you create something like this. And there's intricate detail here. So whoever carved this had to actually know about you know, the internal structure of these things and the behavior that have been captured here. So it expresses this deep intimacy with the natural world. So when you come across something like this in the steps of you know, the European continent, it ends up like this on the walls of caves. This is abstract parietal art. Or when we, when we see and we witness relationships like this, we create things like this. And this was originally thought that this was like a hunting amulet until they realized that all they had to do was to take this one amulet that's both sides, that's two sides of a single piece put them on a stand like this, suddenly you've recreated this, this behavior that, that you still see today. I've seen it a million times in, in antelope and impala and gazelles. It's called stodding. And so we have figured out to, to take this storytelling capacity and animate the world and, and show, you know, express our intimacy with the world. Eventually, if you take these qualities of storytelling and metaphor and you give them enough time to, to, to self-reflect, they become something like this. And this, our life, exempt from public haunt, find tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stone and good in everything. This is William Shakespeare. Um, and so this is, this is how we go from those, those stone tools to, to what we now think of as high art. And here's another one. And this, I think, speaks to that question of, is this a spiritual thing? Um, um, this is a place uh, near uh, on the banks of the River Wye, where I took this photograph. I was following um, a poet who wrote this. Uh, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky and in the mind of man. So this is William Wordsworth in 1798. Um, but what you can see is the whole, you can see Oika represented here, that he has felt. Remember I said Oika can be felt? He has felt presence that disturbs him with joy. It feels good. It's disturbing, feels good. Elevated thoughts, something sublime. It's interfused. He's identifying how there's these deep continuities in this interfusion between the world and the self. And then he gets into the science and it dwells in the light of setting suns. He sees it in the round ocean and the living air and the blue sky. And most importantly, he sees it in the mind of man. And this goes right back to the first quote I shared with you about the geologist saying that it's our, that it's our separation from the earth. It's the psychological, uh, it's a psychological phenomena that causes us to mistreat the earth. 
So I, I thought I'd add this. It's just sort of a contemporary. I think it sounds a lot like Oika, so I'll just play it. For my ally is the Force, and the powerful ally it is. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings, though we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you, here, between you, me, the tree, the rock, everywhere. Yes. Okay, so <clears throat> I need to finish up here. So Wicca is scientific, it is narrative, it, and it tells the story of us. It's experiential, and the experience is a sense of deep continuity and belonging and contentedness. I can attest for that. Um, and again, is it spiritual? I don't know. Up to you. But my question, I guess, at this point is, do you think that any of these qualities of this experience could help us respond at a deep enough level to the Anthropocene? especially if we stop thinking about the Anthropocene as a series of problems, because they're actually a, pro a series of symptoms. But what is the deeper problem? Do you think that this idea, this, this conception, this, this relationship that one feels to the planet might help us respond adequately to the problems of the Anthropocene? So again, I think that um, uh, spas and wellness centers could, and I think especially those in the green, uh, the um, GSM are uniquely um, qualified to, to play this role of reintroducing guests to, to this deep story, which is a wellspring of a sense of belonging and care. And then couple that to the, to the economic and social transformations that are just around the corner. So, I, so, I'd like to explore a little bit about what the role could be in this. Um, again, think about what Oika research is. It's about understanding the continuities and the symmetries between nature and how those can be brought to culture. How can we create a culture that's more aligned with nature? Talk about an alignment problem. Um, Oika, I teach courses. I teach a course called Oika for Earthlings. I teach another one called Oika for Artists, which is specifically for artists. Perhaps we could think about how... Um, the curriculum that I offer, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute, uh, might be integrated into something that's done at spas. Or would we bring like art? I'm going to show you in a minute um, a lot of the artistic projects that we have underway. We've got all kinds of uh, Oika events. In fact, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm bringing uh, some indigenous um, medicine men and some elders out to the island of Nantucket, and we're, they're going to perform a stomp dance, which is a healing ritual. Um, so there's events like that that could be organized. And then there's also media. So it goes active in creating educational media. This is a screen grab of, a, of course content. Um, if anyone's interested, I can pull up an actual um, link to this and I can show you how it's interactive. But what you see here are many of the, the concepts and principles of OICA on the right. On the left is the progression of the course. And there's a really important part here that's, I'm not sure where it's represented, but they're called earth stories. So each one of these little boxes tells a little story of something that happened on Earth. And Earth stories are kind of the currency of Oika. And, and, and how they work is that I ask people to go out and, you know, just sit with nature. To kind of like forest bathing, but you sit with nature, you contemplate it, you let it, you let it in, you let it listen to it. And then at some point you capture it in some way. You say, I'm going to either take a picture of it or perhaps a video or maybe nothing like that. Maybe just... Just try it, write something, write a poem, or, or nothing at all. But the point is then you come to the course, you come to the gathering of other people, and you share that story. And what you realize is that you're telling an earth story every time you do it. When you actually start to accumulate an earth story, it becomes the earth story. So you go from telling an earth story to actually telling the earth story. So it's little things like this that are built into the course that we could consider. These are just some images from a lot of the things that Oika does. We created some bar that tells the story of the universe. We have this practice called hamwiking, which is really about deep and, and, and radical affection that we can create in relationship with trees and things around us. 
again, I do a lot of workshops. I've worked with a lot of scientific field stations with artists. I've got, um, got colleagues all over Europe. Uh, one has started this art residency uh, in Spain. Perhaps we could do something that looks like that. We frequently um, initiate these little mini uh, expeditions. Uh, this one was with three artists who decided they wanted to go to Greece. They've created this amazing um, documentation of their trip. And it's all very much within the spirit of Oika. It's about spending time in deep and contemplative relationship to nature. Uh, I've got another one coming on uh, in Nantucket that includes uh, an exhibition in the gallery here. All work with place-based artists. So artists that come in and are willing to spend time in deep communion with the natural habitat. And in doing so, we also heal the places. There's, there's um, uh, ecological restoration projects that we can tie these and all kinds of interesting ways to do that. The idea there is to bring the healing power of nature to culture through art. I work a lot with uh, one artist, Rita LaDuke, and we have a project that's ongoing called Ecology Extended up at Howard Brook, but we could do something like this. Uh, these are some of the practices that, that you can do. This is one where you use this clear sheet to project your identity, really, and your experience out into the world. And then you put this representational surface in between. Anyway, it's this great exercise to show just how... Do you remember when I was telling the story about um, Sahel and Thoris seeing the berries, and it was the berries that coaxed the primate into the world to go further? That's what we see going on here. We're actually recreating that phenomenon, that, that quality of experience in an artistic context and seeing what happens, sharing our experiences. This is um, this is part of an exhibition that we recently did up at a, a museum at the University of New Hampshire, I'm sorry, Plymouth Plym State University, I'm sure. Um, shot of just a, um, a residency, artist residency in Spain. And we do a lot of film film production stuff. So this is one that we actually have going on right now. It's a film about, film about Oika. So uh, the question is, I heard it to be a disruptor. Uh, there's my proposal again. Um, and my argument here is that this idea of Oika elicits the deep alignment of personal, natural, cultural. So my question then to you is, how could Oika integrate expand, enhance the things that you have going on at spars, spas. Um, so any one of these that I've talked about could be a potential one, but I want to present a few more. Perhaps Oika is kind of a new form of yoga. That's how I, that's how I tend to think of it. Oika is not an organization. Oika is not a brand. Oika is not a, you know, it's nothing that could be, you know, propriety, uh, proprietorship could be claimed in any, any more than yoga could be. It's really about practice and a way of attuning to the intelligence of, of nature uh, that has profound ameliorative effects. So perhaps we can think about something like Wicca therapy. And I'll just close out by saying, you know, what are your ideas? Perhaps we can, you know, during the Q&A, if you have any ideas about how Wicca might be able to be integrated, I'd love to hear them. I'm doing. So that's one hour. Um, we're at one hour right now. And um, yeah, I guess that's it for me. If you want to um, learn more, there's a QR code here. I mean, a QR code you could you could um, scan. Uh, and I would love to continue the conversation. I will say this. There's a lot more to this. I know I've been speaking a lot and covered a lot of territory, but it's through questions. It's through conversation that we could actually get to the really deep and beautiful stuff. So I encourage you to, to stick around. And if you have any inclination to ask a question, I encourage you to do it because I can almost guarantee that it'll open up, um, it'll open up some new profound territory. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank wow. you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, that, was, that was a lot, I'm sure, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. Um, Doris, or anything that you have from the chat? Well, I do, I have a question or two I could open with. I wanted, um, I did want to encourage any of our attendees to type any questions you may have into the Q&A and I can monitor those and bring those up for discussion. Um, I will say, I will say one of, one of the high points for me in, in this um, speech was just the aligning yourself with the planet versus trying to change the planet is what's going to bring success 
and you know and taking care of taking care of ourselves and taking care of mother earth and i i just think that's a great approach and i think it's something that gets lost easily it's true it's it, it's really asks us to stop with our you know uh, obsession with necessarily doing things and just allowing ourselves to feel things and over time uh, those feelings will uh, they'll manifest in the right doing if you um, if you listen you know mm -hmm. we do have I another think... question oh I'm sorry Maggie go ahead no, you go no you go I'll, I'll... Um, we do have one question that just came through are you currently partnered with any resorts, spas, or hospitality businesses? And if so, how? Um, I am partnered with some nonprofit organizations that teach uh, science, uh, astronomy, natural history, um, and also with um, uh, some art galleries. Uh, but not this, not 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 spas spe specifically. This is kind of a new new world for me and um but that's i think that's where the opportunity is actually it's, that's what i'm trying to say here is that this there's there's a huge opportunity for spas to play a part in this kind of awakening just in the way that the, that they operate the way they communicate what it is they do and the and 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 the services that they you know that they offer so, so no, is, is nothing specific yet other than- Not yet, not yet. <laughs> but you speak spa language, you speak, you speak our language. That's fascinating um, to me because it's fascinating. That's, what, that's like, as I've been doing research, I've just, I see it again and again. It's like, ding, ding, ding. There's like, there's a real, there's a real synergy there that has not been really um, developed yet. And the time is, the time is right for that to be developed. Yeah. And there's, you know, even from the start, this about transformation, there's so much happening in our spas and there is a shift, you know, there's, um, there's traditional stuff that's going in spas, but I think this, the, the spas or even get that spa word, like if we, if we can talk wellness and, and kind of these spaces that are created for this transformation to happen and how do we do that? I, you know, I found one thing super interesting. I, um, that slide where you said, Oka is scientific narrative, experiential, spiritual. Well, I could have changed Oka and put spa is scientific, narrative, experiential, spiritual. And so, so much of what we're doing um, in our spas is, or trying to do, you know, we talk about wanting to transform our guests, but how are we doing it? Are we forcing it? And do we have to look at some of this work that you're doing? So it's not such a forced and contrived I don't want to offend anyone, but you know that that we we you're, the the work that you've done is it just I I have to watch this like twelve more times. I'm not that smart, and um, to really grasp grasp like a lot of what you're saying, mm -hmm. um, it's it, there's a lot there. There's it's a lot. lot of, it's a lot of content. Normally, you know, I would do that over a longer period of time with a lot more interaction, but I think just the other take is that there is this story. You know, that that if you really look at, let, let's not even say the whole history of the universe. Okay, let's let's just let's go 4.6 billion years back as opposed to 13.8 billion. Let's just go back to the beginning of the earth and look at what what's transpired on this earth to bring us to where we are. There is this as of yet unknown story about how the earth has endowed us with everything that we hold dear about ourselves. We are earthlings, you know, to the core. The, 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 the most beautiful things about us have been endowed upon us by the earth. And, and I don't, I'm not trying to make any sort of like categorical, you know, claim on the soul or anything like that. I'm just saying that if we look at the history of our relationship to this planet, I mean, the, and the abundance that it has afforded us, all all the all the way it just it strikes me as absurd that we would think that that we would live in a scarcity mindset and mm -hmm. if we are living in a scarcity mindset that then that is a um that is somehow an artifact of our culture it's not an artifact of nature i can tell you that and if we could just get 
reminded of that again, then slowly we would start to start to disentangle the 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 more, for lack of a better word, pathological we have on this planet, which is a dead end. You know, one of the phrases I use a lot in, is um, that the future is beautiful, or there isn't one. Those are the choices: a beautiful future or a really ugly non-future. I mean, are we that stupid to not work toward the beautiful? And what Oika is trying to say is that there's at least a reason to, to feel and to, um, to acknowledge that beauty. Because I think if you do, if you, if you really do get into touch with the way that this planet has cared for us, it, in, it, it imparts on you a sense of gratitude. And that gratitude is an incredible antidote to, to grievance and to like hyper consumption, things like that. Those things just become irrelevant if you, if, if you have a, um, uh, a different relationship to the world. I know how naive this might sound, but it's not naive. It is idealistic, but it's not naive. Um, and I think um, I start. I just I wanted to start taking this stuff seriously. That that this is a beautiful planet that tells us incredible story about us, and we need to like live as if that's real, live as if that's true, because it is. The science shows us that that that's, that that's true. Um, so I just hope that that's an opportunity in terms of like cultural evolution. Because I got to tell you, when I look at when I look at the current state of things in, in terms of just the way that algorithms have just completely messed up our, 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 our perceptions of things, that we need to, we need to recultivate a, a connection to something much bigger than you know, the wishes of Silicon Valley. I don't mean to get political here or like, I just think we need we, we can do better. I think we can do better. Well, that's what we're about. And that's why I think the people that are, are joining this call, the people that are part of this community, um, we want to we, we want to be better. And I think that, you know, what you talked about today, there is a true synergy between what you talked about and what we're what what we strive to do um, in our spaces. And again, I think I have to go back to my Desmond Tutu, like. How do we how do we process in what you just said, which is an elephant, <laughs> one one bite at a time? There's there's a lot there, but I think some of those things that you put at the end, um, those actual things that you you're doing, that um, I don't know. I'm I'm hoping that those on this call, and then when we, you know this is posted on our um, on our website, and you know you're this partner with us, that we can like this. This is this is necessary. This is super necessary and super important. And um, and just I, I I I'm honored to have had you share. You know you 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 went on and on and on. And I my brain was saying my brain hurt. But when you like when you tied it back and again the your language um, your language is is the language of of spa and wellness and yeah. um, where we're striving to get to. So. Um, uh, Dara, was there any other um, any other comments or? I do see a hand um, at least. Um, yes, we have another question from one of our attendees, uh, Jonathan. I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Here. Thank you, thank you very much. This is Jonathan Paul Devereville down in Texas. You speak truth, goodness, beauty with awe. Really, really appreciated it. I got a nice chill. What was fascinating to me is earlier today, I just before I came on here, I was watching the CBS uh, uh, discussion on AI and the new Google Bard and that whole, and, and I, the thought was, what might be the impact of all of that, that whole other conversation? But I really appreciate your great story of the universe. It reminds me of uh, Thomas Berry in his mm -hmm. work, I'm sure you, The Dream of the Earth and the Earth Story and, and Tar Tehar de Chardin. So mm -hmm. you're in really good company the way you do it. But what, uh, what I really enjoy is the way you're making it practical. You're making mm -hmm. it, you're putting it into practice. 
which I really think the spa culture really needs. For me, spa is soul, psyche, and anima. And it's, mm. it, it, it brings in that whole other realm of the, the unconscious the, the, as well as consciousness. And I think you're right on because consciousness is primary. I'd really like to connect. I didn't know that you existed two hours ago. And so I, this is the, so you just popped in. I had a great friend, Mary Bemis, say, are you watching uh, Rich? And I said, no, I'm watching 60 Minutes. And she said, well, you, yeah, I like Rich. So that's how I, but I mean, I read, anyways, thank you very, very much for this. There's some other questions too, and we can talk later offline, is how might all of this relate to what is happening in terms of exo studies and exo consciousness and exo politics? This has to do with the fact that the Defense Department is now saying that there are aliens. Uh, it's not the Russians, it's not the Chinese, it's not us, that there is a new non-human form of intelligence that is being identified in the cosmos, which really sets up spas for a great place for threshold on that. But I know I'm jumping in with both feet here because we are earth humans and we we need to be uh, you know contain and be with earth as a sacred as our as our motherland I, I totally agree with everything you're saying and what you've done but there are threats i wouldn't say threats there are challenges on the edge with ai and with et so those are some things I, i'd really like to maybe start a conversation with you about that and look at how we might prepare ourselves and help others prepare themselves for these these new challenges. So mm. thank you much, Rich. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, there there are consequences, uh, and I think there are implications to all the things you mentioned. Certainly for AI, I think I think our well, one of the things that I that becomes clear is when you think in terms of the the let's say seven million year relationship that humans have had with this planet, and how it's taken seven million years. For that intelligence to impart itself onto our bodies and on our minds. Okay, so that's the whole point of that 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 Sahelanthropus species seeing the berries and thinking, "I'm going to go." Uh, that's getting seduced into the world. That's what that is. Yeah. That's the world seducing the primate to, 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 to into relationship with it. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a cognitive that's a cognitive endowment. So we create this artificial intelligence, but. Nowhere is that long, sustained, intimate relationship right. with a planet represented in the AI. So, mm -hmm. I, so to to start talking about it as if it's equivalent to human intelligence is just absurd. And yeah, so, it, it, however, however, it's powerful, and and in the hands of those who covet power, it could be, you know, and, and or in the hands of those who would seek to like monetize our attention. It's an incredibly powerful tool, but I'm more worried about the, I'm more worried about the humans that are that are using that are exploiting it to exploit us. <laughs> yes. Than the yeah. actual technology, because, yeah. because when you because when you compare it to the ecological intelligence that that we have that has been endowed upon us, it just doesn't stack up. It, oh, totally. Yeah. And so there's, yeah, there's so, yeah. So there's yeah. a whole philosophical problem of alignment of it's it's its values being aligned with our values and that yeah that is important more concerned about how our values align with the planet's values perfect yeah yeah and there's always an on off switch we i mean it runs on electricity we can always put the off switch to turn it off yeah, yeah but i still think we need to change again let's let's be clear about what's a, what's a problem and what's a symptom because it, who would produce something like that? Yeah, yeah. What's the mindset that would create those things? That's what we need to work on. That's on, that's the upstream problem yeah. that needs to be addressed. And I think, I think really examining our relationship to the complexity and the beauty of the world is an antidote to that kind of thinking. Totally. Not totally. that not that not that I'm trying to like you know, uh, um, um, colonize the thing people think or 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 standardize it. I'm just saying, look at the story, look at, look at the natural history of us, and you will come to other conclusions about, you will be equipped with that intelligence to deal with these problems. So, and as far as the extraterrestrial or alien, look, I look at the universe, nothing, nothing surprises me anymore. You know, it, it's, 
it would yeah. not it, it would blow my mind if there were other intelligences out there so you know the question is have they figured out how to live in right relationship to their world yeah which is the same question we need to be asking ourselves so mm -hmm. yeah right relationship all of my relations absolutely thank you very very much thank you jonathan oh nice yeah i'll be in touch you. thank you okay thank you sorry do you have any anything else um i have one more question say a uh, spa director is inspired today and they they're just thinking about what would you recommend as first steps like what what would be a good starting place to try to implement oika in their environment well i would say reach out and to, you know reach out to me and have a conversation i think you know from what i know a lot of these spas are in just places of astounding natural beauty and even if it's just, you know, local. Um, so I would just say, think about what are the elements of your local place that could um, sustain a kind of wake of practice. So it's, it's like forest bathing. So it's, you know, I think you could think about it in that way, but it's forest bathing on steroids because it comes with a deep well of conceptual knowledge that enhances the experience of forest bathing. You know, once you understand, I'm going to get technical here, but once you understand the phospholipid bilayer, which is like this, which is like the case, which is the envelope that living, that living organisms use. And once you understand how we pack biomolecules into these exosomes and all living things are releasing them all the time, you understand how forest bathing works. You are immersed in the signals of communication of living things. And if you're in a healthy ecosystem, you, you know, you, 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 it just makes sense that forest bathing works. This is not, I'm not answering your question, so I should. I would just say, reach out and let's talk about it. This is like, I've just started thinking about this. So I, I want to hear other, I want, I think it, I think it would be idiosyncratic to place maybe, or maybe artists, like let's, let's put an artist in residence who can create art and interact with guests and, and spend deep contemplative, contemplative time in place. And, you know, make that happen and tell that story, you know, use, use media to tell that story. Let's, let's, let's develop a, uh, a workshop. Let's develop, or even just a course. You know, like I said, I teach this wake up earth, or earth story walks. I don't know if you can tell, but on that shelf there, those are all fossils. And, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there's, that's actually this, a, a, a cast of a skull of um, Sahelanthropus chadensis. I put all that stuff in a backpack and go for a hike. And what I do is tell the story of the earth. So it's about a, a million, um, a million years per stride. And we walk 4.6 kilometers and each stride is a million years. And I tell the story of these major thresholds, just little things like that, that can, that can bring the story of the earth, you know, to, to people that are in the place. So there's a lot of things we could do. I think it's just a question of, um, um, starting up a conversation. Wow. I want to do all of those <laughs> now. <laughs> it's, now. It never gets old, too, because when, when you're in it, like when you're out there telling the Earth story and you're with the Earth, and then something shows up that like that either like drives the point home or or brings it in a different direction, it's just such a complex, beautiful wor world that it never gets old. You know, it never ceases to amaze and feel good. And then, and these things that happen, they happen again and again and again. And they, they come back to you in moments when you really, you know, when, when you're, when your guard is down, they come back to you and really um, uh, just change the way we, the way we relate to the world. I think you're, what you're also kind of hitting on is mindfulness and being present and intentionality. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. I think it all ties in, but you, you bring it in in such a, a way that uh, is new to me, I'm sure, that, and probably new to most on here. And so um, I think introducing you into our world is, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing, seeing the um, positive uh, impact um, that we can have on our, 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 our planet and, our, and ourselves and our connection to it with not only, you know, our, ourselves, but our guests and those that were again, that we're trying to transform and we're doing, and we can do it in the, in this truest sense of Oika. Um, 
Uh, it's really just such an honor to, to listen to you. I'm sure that, you know, again, this is going, going to be on our website. Um, we'll, uh, GSN is all about what you're about and we'll continue to work with you yeah. and, and um, share you with our, with our community. So Beautiful. I feel, thank you I feel so the same much. way. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's, been a, it's yeah. been a privilege and very enlightening to listen to you all. So just thank you so much. You're, you're welcome. Um, well, I guess uh, in, in closing, um, thank you. I, I, I can really just say, wow, like I wish I had more. I just have to unpack all of that information that Rich just shared. And um, I think the, the first panel that we had today um, was really great. And I think we can see there's so much going on out there in so many different levels, but I think it really laid the groundwork um, for tomorrow with um, Rene LaRue in the second session tomorrow um, is gonna be showcasing the GSN GreenSpot Calculator, this amazing app that um, has spent years and years and years to create, but it's just a tool, um, it's an audit tool that will help spas just move consciously towards sustainability. And it's, um, and it's, it's, it's again, I don't, I don't know why I'm so obsessed with this elephant, but, um, but it's not about doing it all at once. And this, this app, the sustainable, um, the calculator really helps you to see where you are and where you are on this journey and where you need to get to and can, and I don't want to get into too much of it, but I'm really looking forward to, to um, Charnay speaking of that uh, tomorrow. Um, and then also tomorrow, um, the first panel is going to be Mike Brugman, um, and he's moderating a panel on biotech beauty and the transition um, from clean beauty. So really looking forward to, um, to, to that tomorrow. And I, I, I like to keep things simple. Um, but I did want to end today with an excerpt from a book called How to Be More Tree by Liz Marvin. And this is called Draw Strength from Others. And it's about the aspen tree. Making the effort to connect with those around us can bring powerful results. As knows there's no prize acting like a tough guy who doesn't need anyone. In fact, belonging to something bigger than themselves is key to their strength. Each straight trunk tree may look like a tall and proud individual, but under the surface is a part of the single organism connected by their root system to all of the other trees in the, in the stand. If one tree is closer to water or important nutrients, it can share the goodies with the rest of that gang. And I just think that really kind of speaks to kind of what, what, what we're about here and, um, and, and where we're going. And we need to be doing this together and draw from the strength of each other. So thank you, Aspen Trees, for that. Um, they, it's worked pretty much out of time. So I just want to say thank you for choosing to spend your time with us today. Um, and the earth needs us now more than ever, the planet. We need that connection that people and the, and the planet um, and make the difference really starts with us, our purpose and our passion. And together um, we can make strides to make this happen. So thank you again for your time and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye.